Greetings, everyone. It's time to get started. I hope that those that celebrate had a great Thanksgiving with families and friends. Um, thank you for joining us today for Pillar's monthly webinar series, where we talk to leaders in the HR space about all things talent acquisition and HR tech related. I'm with Thompson, and I lead the customer success efforts here at Pillar. For those of you who may not know, Pillar is an inter interview intelligence platform that uses AI to help you run an efficient interview process analyze your interviews and train your team to be better interviewers. I'm really excited about our, our conversation today featuring Craig Fisher. Hey, Craig. The found, I wait. Craig is the founder of the recruitment operations and marketing consultancy, Talent Net Media. He's an acclaimed author of the best-selling book, Hiring Humans, and he led the global marketing employer brand functions at Allegis Global Solutions and the tech giant, CA Technologies. His digital branding best practices have been adopted by some of the biggest companies, Cisco, LinkedIn, Toyota, Yum Brands, Microsoft, could go on and on. Um, and what are we gonna talk to with him today? Well, as we all know, AI and automation are the buzzwords of the day. Yet amid this tech revolution, it's important to not forget that people want to work with people. Keeping that in mind, Craig is going to show us how a bit of tech some better processes and keeping the human touch alive can make all the difference when it comes to showing candidates that you want them in your organization. Now, we always start with the same two questions for each of our guests. So keeping in tradition, Craig, why did you decide to build a career in HR? So let's see here. I'll tell you uh, with, I didn't. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Like, like many people in uh, recruiting or talent acquisition, um, I got into this sort of accidentally. Um, I was a, uh, out of school. I was a pharmaceutical rep for Glaxo. And oh, interesting. Yeah. And, um, and I was good at uh, the sales part, um, but I was also really good at uh, recruiting people for our team. And really enjoyed the. I became a you know a team leader and got to hire and uh, and interview and all all these things. I'd also done a really good job of researching how to get that kind of job in the first place. Uh, and so in college, I actually did an internship uh, for a company called Physician Sales and Service, where I learned basically every medical product you could get your hands on because I would pack them in delivery bags and put them in a van and drive them to a doctor's office uh, for delivery. And uh, and Glaxo really liked that I had that experience already. Um, it also didn't hurt that I was graduating in December instead of the spring with the rest of my class. So there were fewer people to be in competition with. All of these things came together to make this perfect swirl for me to get this amazing job right out of school. And so, um, a few years into it, uh, I had become, uh, I started doing surgical sales uh, and uh, Congress changed the way that it, uh, we were allowed to entertain doctors, um, mm. right? In the mid nineties. Right. right. And, and uh, so a bunch of my uh, friends in the industry jumped over to physician recruiting and I got recruited into physician recruiting, right? Less travel, uh, more money, all the promises. Sure. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so once you get into that sort of uh, recruiting environment, you, you really never get out. Um, most people don't anyway. Wow. And so I was hooked because it's a really good mix of, of sales and helping people and research and, you know, a lot of fun things. And, um, and I was able to use my, you know, marketing and advertising degree to kind of help with job promotion and employer branding. And I was constantly teaching yeah. my customers how to uh, brand themselves better. Wow. And uh, and eventually that led to tech recruiting and the tech boom and uh, the rest is history. Wow. Wow. The long and winding road. That's right. <laughs> we end up places. Um, okay. Number two, what is the one thing that people would be surprised to know about you? Yes. So um, my company, Talent Net Media, is a minority owned business and I am a card carrying Cherokee Indian. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. That's I actually fantastic. have 
Yeah, I actually have a, a, a Bureau of Indian Affairs card laminated and in my wallet that I can use in a pinch as a government ID, uh, which is amazing. And my family in eastern Oklahoma uh, gathers twice a year on some property that we have there uh, with a camp campsite and all these little uh, campers and tiny houses and a stage and a volleyball court and a baseball diamond, all all the stuff in the shadow of uh, Sequoia's cabin. Uh, He was a noted Cherokee Indian that wrote the Indian alphabet. And so right there in, you know, Cherokee territory, we gather twice a year and people come from all over the country. And sometimes we have as many as 200 plus people uh, joining these awesome things that have been going on since the year 2000. Wow. That, that genuinely sounds very cool. Sorry. That, the year 1980. 19. Oh, wow. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Well, that is a good long time. That's a very, that's a very good one. I feel like every once in a while you feel like somebody punts on that question and that you just took that right, right. Head out. That's great. That's a great one. <laughs> okay. So before we let Craig take it away, um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we always tend to have a very active chat stream here, and we'd love to keep it, to keep that going. So feel free to comment and ask questions throughout. We'll get to as many as we can. And if we don't, we'll try to follow up to it, follow up with afterwards. Um, and also, we'll be sharing a few polls along the way. Uh, so be sure to participate as as, as they pop up. Um, with that, with that out of the way, you know what? I'll pass it off to Craig. Craig, it's all yours. Thanks, with. Uh, I have just shared my. LinkedIn profile link um, in the in the chat. I'm not going to be able to chat in real time. Um, I'll kind of see the questions, but with is going to interrupt if you have a question and feel free because this is going to be kind of a, a free flowing affair. It's going to be a lot of stream of consciousness going on. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, but I do have slides I'm about to share. And uh, yeah, so there's a there's a picture of me. Um, and this picture of me is is all over the place. And so if you've if you know me at all, you've seen this picture before. Um, and uh, there's no good reason for it to be there. So I'm just going to jump to the next slide. Uh, this is my family in 1974. Um, this is is my actual uh, actual portrait of myself, my sister, uh, my mom and dad, our dog, cat and gerbil are all in this picture, uh, right? And so you might ask, what? Oh my God, what's gerbil. What's, it's amazing, right? What's the point of me sharing this? Well, the, the point is, um, I feel like when you introduce yourself to someone, um, you should always tell them something personal or even maybe slightly embarrassing about yourself. And then you open it up for them to share with you. So then when you in turn ask, well, tell me about you, um, they feel more comfortable, right? You're, you're more humanized already. And I feel like we should all as ambassadors of our employer organizations, um, you know, share something personal about ourselves as individuals on places like our LinkedIn profile. Um, You don't have to overshare. But in the about section of my LinkedIn profile, I write, you know, that I'm a father of three amazing boys and we live uh, in Grapevine, Texas uh, on the lake. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm suddenly more of a 3D human than the average uh, recruiter or salesperson or marketer trying to connect with you. If you go check me out, there's lots of videos of me talking like this and there's personal information about me that. I feel like everyone should have, you know, three things that they're okay to share with the world and they don't have to compromise your security or make you uh, more vulnerable to um, cyber attack or, you know, anything like that. If you want to share pictures or stories about your loved ones, you can create uh, nicknames for them to share online. So my kids, um, I don't have a picture of my kids here. Well, maybe I do. Hold on. Do I? No, I don't. Okay. Well, I'll show you, I'll share you a picture of my kids here in a minute. Um, My kids for years were named numbers one, two, and three sons. 
Uh, and that's, that's how I referred to them online constantly. And until they got old enough to where they were competing in sports and, uh, you know, needed to NCAA attention and, and things like that. And they could have their own profiles and make their own decisions. But for years, I, I didn't, I didn't want them to be under the same scrutiny necessarily that I was going to be under as a public person. Um, but I still use them shamelessly for marketing purposes all over the internet because, uh, why not? Um, and so just, just a thought, you know, as we lean into this age of automation and tools and listen, I'm all about tools and hacks and, and processes and things to make my job easier. I've got a million just intricate and insane processes linked together to make my world run, my company run and all the things I do and to appear sort of omnipresent online. Um, but, you know, I do not just let automation take over. I jump in and have conversations with people and I keep it personal and human. And, um, you know, I make sure that I'm, I'm touching people in a, in a human and personal way. Uh, so that being said, um, let's talk a little bit about automation. I'm going to show you a lot of tools today, but we're also going to talk about, uh, the human touch. Okay. So empathy. This is a thing that's very important. AI is sort of the word of the day, um, but AI can't do empathy. It's not great at building relationships. That's what we say. That's what we tell ourselves. But is that true? I'm not so sure. All right. So in the 1960s, uh, Professor... Uh, at a very renowned uh, technical college, did an experiment. Um, he built a chatbot. It was the first conversational chatbot. Um, and he had his interns play with it. And it was just a responsive bot. And it mimicked empathy. So he had one of his interns sit down with this chatbot and it worked like this. So you'd sit down with the chatbot and the chatbot would ask, how are you today? Right. This is not on a phone because those didn't exist back then. Right. Mobile phones. Um, this is on a computer screen and you'd write back, uh, well, I'm OK. And the computer would say, oh. Right. Just like that. And then you'd say, well, I've kind of got this going on or that going on. Really? How does that feel? Right. Is what the computer would say. And it would it it would mimic therapy, really. Right. And so one day, uh, Joseph Weizenbaum checked in on his intern that was playing with this program. And she had been up for 24 hours talking to this computer program and pouring her heart out, telling it things that she'd never told anyone. And uh, he realized that this could be dangerous. <laughs> and his quote about it is, what I had not realized is that extremely short exposures to a relatively simple computer program could induce powerful delusional thinking in quite normal people. Uh, and so he shut it down. Um, but it was a really good example of what's possible. And you can actually do this now with pretty much any open AI uh, chatbot, right? You can have a conversation. And I use, I don't know about you all, but I use ChatGPT and Bard every day, maybe every hour of every day. And I constantly catch myself telling it, thank you and please, and right, things that are not necessarily being polite to a, a, a bot. All right, so maybe we should be polite to bots, right? When they, when they take over, they'll not remember. Which of those humans were good to me? Um, all right. So I wrote a book about it called Hiring Humans. And it's about the shortcuts and the hacks and the tools, but also how we keep the relationship part important and the human touch in HR. Uh, and really, if you think about it, what AI, as we know it right now, right? Conversational AI and open AI, which really just debuted 
last year. Um, but AI has been around for a long time, but right. What we know of is this chat GPT format just came out early last year and um, it's good at summarizing things and automating things. So you could, for instance, take an entire employee manual that is training for a certain type of machine operator, which would take normally some one days to read and not comprehend very well and boil it down to, you know, the 10 main points in about 30 seconds. I mean, that's the kind of awesome power that we're talking about. So all these things that we could automate and summarize quickly and then learn from, um, right, to create better messaging and calendar scheduling and, you know, all of these tasks that could be taken off the plates of recruiters to leave recruiters to do the things that they're supposed to do, which is relationship building, um, are good, right? They're, they're good things. And so as long as we're not that there's a, a fear that AI is going to take our jobs and, um, ruin what recruiting does. And that's really not true because if you think about it, the best AI tool that exists is your phone, right? And we all thought, okay, well, when the internet came out, that's going to change recruiting. They're, we're not going to need recruiters anymore. Well, that's not true because the internet's just a tool. Someone has to use it. And so that became a whole industry of search, right, by itself. And then when the mobile phone came out, job boards, right, any of this uh, automated technology, oh, we're not going to need recruit. All not true. All just tools that someone has to use. So there's a quote in my book. Um, by Jerry Crispin, if you know who he is, that he likes to say, someone still has to wind the clocks. And, uh, and it's very true. So this book is, is fun. If you want a copy of it, you can get it at hiring-humans.com. I believe uh, we might be giving away some today uh, to some of the members here. And uh, the other cool thing about it is um, it's real case studies. So I do this very interesting work with enterprise level uh, employers and I fix problems with either talent attraction or candidate experience or the application process or onboarding or tech stack issues that might be causing problems with any of that. And I look at it from, you know, above and, I can spot the problems because I've just been doing this a really long time and I can tell an employer, okay, you need to flip this lever, fix that. This needs to be streamlined, right? All of these things, get me in touch with your HRIS team. Let me sit with a recruiter for a day or two and watch how they do things. Uh, let me get under the hood with your technology vendors and sit in on some of those calls. And within 30 days, I'll have all of this stuff fixed for you and I'll give you a quarterly rollout plan to, uh, you know, better attract and, and convert candidates. Um, and so I had enough of these stories last year in, you know, during COVID and this year when things started to slow down that it made sense to tell it sort of in a logical uh, way about sort of how I do talent attraction and, and hiring. And uh, it works and it's short. You can read it in about 27 minutes. This whole presentation isn't about me talking about my book. What it is going to be telling you is sort of <clears throat> what the book's about via some of these tools I use and processes that you'll appreciate. Um, and how to amplify your brand. Uh, so this is a trick that I've been using for a long time. When I... <clears throat> came out uh, with my um, book debut. Uh, the launch was in September and I created a company page on LinkedIn for the book, okay? And you could do this for any job description you're advertising, right? Or anything, really. If you're unemployed right now, create a, make up a company and create a LinkedIn company page for it. They get really good SEO. All right. Wow. And, yeah. And then I changed my I changed my current job 
to being, I didn't close talent net media. I didn't close my time there, but I added a job under my experience on LinkedIn that just said author at hiring humans full time. And it, I explained what I did, right? You could do this with a job description <clears throat> and uh, a whole bunch of people immediately followed the page. Everyone in my network and everyone that follows me, which is tens of thousands of people got notified that Craig Fisher has a new job, right? <laughs> so if you say, and you could even just change your current job title to currently hiring uh, marketing interns at ABC company, right? Same trick works with the algorithm. Everyone in your network will get notified about your new job title and ask them to celebrate with you. Yay. Congratulate Craig on his new job title that he's hiring marketing interns at talent net media right now. Right. And so that's free advertising. And this is something that LinkedIn doesn't hate. Um, in fact, they love it. They think it's so cool that they asked me to teach their entire sales team about how to do some of these tricks that I do with LinkedIn. Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And so a few years ago, uh, I got to go all over the country to LinkedIn offices and do work inside their offices and train their salespeople about how to use LinkedIn better. Unbelievable. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so that's free hack number one. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a bunch. Oh, here's my kids. Finally. <clears throat> All right. So uh, this is numbers one, two, and three sons. Uh, more about me. It's pretty soon, audience, I'm going to ask about you. I want you all in the comments um, to say something slightly embarrassing about yourselves, or at least just slightly personal, right? Again, don't compromise your data security. <laughs> uh, this is my dogs and my wife. Uh, she is a Texas Longhorns fan, and I'm an Oklahoma Sooner. And we have a house divided flag in front of our house, hanging off the porch. And right, I'm also a Cowboys fan. You can tell from this picture. I yeah. redid my backyard recently. Uh, so if you follow me on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, uh, I'm at Fish Dogs, F I S H D O G S, on all of those channels. You'll see all these pictures of pets and travel and sports and my backyard renovation. Yeah. It, 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 it looks like that dog in the middle, especially it really has it tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's he, uh, a charmed life. Yeah. He's in, he's enjoying his environment for sure. <laughs> um, okay. So here's another basically free tool. Uh, there's a, there's a paid version of this, but you can use it for free. I built a lot of the graphics for this presentation uh, with sketch. Wow. All right. And it's got these built in flow charts and diagrams, and it just gives you a little kind of interesting way to present things. And so this is my flow chart of recruitment marketing. So if I were to do some work with you on your employer brand or uh, whatever, right, we'd start out with a design thinking session and then we do a process and brand audit and actually walk through uh, applying to some of your jobs on every platform and uh, every type of device uh, from Indeed or Facebook or Google, wherever you might find that job. And I recommend you do the same thing. And we're gonna talk about that more in just a minute. But anyway, SketchWow is a really cool tool that I love that will help you kind of present things uh, in an interesting, more graphic way. All right, this is my philosophy. <clears throat> uh, none of these things work in a bubble. Sometimes we get focused as employers. And by the way, I've been an employer most of my career, right? But I've also led talent acquisition functions at big companies. And um, so I'm, I'm not always a consultant. Sometimes I'm on the inside and, um, you know, so I, I, I know the job uh, very well. And what I've seen is we create these project teams to do these efforts. And we say, all right, Ralph and Jane and, and Charlie, we're, you're going to be on this team because we need to improve our, uh, uh, our recruitment process. 
our application sucks, our candidate experience sucks, we, we got to fix this. But then there's a separate team that's working on uh, the applicant tracking system. And then there's another team that's responsible for the employer brand. And nobody's stepping back to look at how all these things work together properly, right? And they do all have to work together. What you want is seamless hiring. You want no roadblocks. And so, uh, you know, in your candidate journey, if you're really being empathetic to what a candidate goes through, uh, which you should be, you're looking at all of these things. Uh, you're going to zoom out and take a look, and then you're going to drill down and take a microscope and a stopwatch to everything that happens. How does your messaging feel uh, when you get a response to applying to your job? How long did it take? All of these things. <clears throat> so you want to know yourself, right? Uh, this, by the way, is an animation that I did with Mid Journey for my book. Uh, so I had a I had a, uh, a book production team um, that helped me and uh, they were my whatever they were they were they did a lot and they sent me this this zip file full of graphics for the book and I looked at it and I'm like eh, it just doesn't look like me it doesn't feel like me I'm pretty hands on guy with Adobe products and I do video production and sound design and I do graphic design, all this stuff. I mean, I, so I'm such a hands-on control freak. I taught myself how to code back in the late nineties mm. when I started recruiting uh, tech developers, right. And engineers so that I could hang out in their chat rooms as a, a user instead of a recruiter. Sure. Cause you, you remember you'd get kicked out, right? If you're in the AOL chat room or whatever, and you're just recruiting people, they, you get, you get banned. So I was in there asking legitimate questions. So anyway, I, I said, listen, let me give it, let me give this a try. And I recreated all the uh, animations and graphics for, for my book uh, with mid journey, which is a really cool um, design tool and, almost everything you can do speech to image now, right? With Canva and Adobe Express, and, uh, you know, a lot of these tools, even chat GPT. But what I like about uh, Mid Journey is that you can use um, other tools to talk to it. Uh, so you don't, you don't have to necessarily just use um, Mid Journey platform itself. All right. So you want to know yourself. Um, you want to walk through your own application process and um, check the timing on the communication back to you. Does anyone get back to you? Where do you hit a firewall where you have to log in with maybe right an email address and uh, create a, a profile? And then go back two weeks later and do it again and see if you use the right email address to log in and right 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 right, right. I mean, for sure what's what's that what's that username and uh oh my gosh okay and so really do this and you really want to be the the people who are applying to your jobs are your future teammates right they are your colleagues they're in the same industry as you so why would we treat them any differently than we would treat our best customers, right? Or even our prospective customers. If, if you're a customer and you're buying from, you know, XYZ company and you've got all these problems and you don't complete your purchase and the company finds out that, you know, the people who do the UI and UX uh, design for that experience just aren't checking to see if it's any good. Well, those people get fired, right? I mean, they don't have jobs anymore. So why as a recruiting or talent acquisition or operations team, would we not be intricately involved on an almost daily basis with exactly the experience that our candidates are having? Oh, well, Craig, I put a job out and we get 2000 candidates that aren't even a fit. Okay, big deal. <laughs> Do they know someone that's a fit maybe? Do they live next door to your next hire? 
sure. you never know, right? You ne you just never do know. Okay. Um, so some of these comments are pretty great. Yeah. First 50, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, coming for, in from Atlanta, Georgia, Michigan Wolverine fans. Go blue. All right. I like it. Hey, hey Chris, Craig, I think we may have a poll that we could okay. throw up. Okay. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Which of these areas will be your number one priority heading into 2024? Your recruitment process and candidate experience, recruitment marketing, employer branding, technology, or other. I like this poll. I and Craig, what mine is and what I'm seeing. Yeah. It's looking right, like right now about still a lot coming in, but at least at the moment, we're it's looking like about 50% are saying recruitment process and candidate experience. Mm -hmm. That sounds about right. That's good. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. And what we know about candidate experience, right, is that um, it should be intricately tied with your onboarding experience. And people decide within the first, you know, very short amount of time, if they get a job offer, how that offer is handled, how the timing goes with getting onboarded, how everything should happen and how it feels it determines how long they think they're going to stay at that organization, right? And a candidate starts feeling that from the application experience and the candidate experience. So it bleeds into your employees for sure. Okay, so you wanna know your audience, right? Who is it you're trying to attract? You're gonna have multiple personas, sometimes multiple personas for just one job, but within your organization, there are micro cultures. Your company is not just one culture and you're not trying to just hire one type of person. Uh, so you wanna know your audience and the way I do that is to build personas. And I use a tool called an empathy map. So a few years ago, I got to uh, join a group called the IBM Futurists, and I was invited to join a bunch of uh, fancy influencers in New York at IBM headquarters. And we went to the Watson building and did all this design thinking stuff to hack the future of work. And one of the uh, exercises we did was this empathy map, and it's how marketers uh, envision their potential customers so that they can create good messaging for them, right? So you know when a commercial feels like it really hits home with you. Well, it's designed to do that, right? Because you're in the demographic. And so I thought to myself, okay, well, why aren't we doing that for our job candidates? Uh, so this is back in 2015. And so immediately I created my own version of an empathy map and started showing it at conferences and doing it with my own team. And the exercise goes like this. You draw this chart on a whiteboard and you say, what do your candidates hear, think and feel, see, say and do? What are their pain points? And how can you answer that with gains that are sort of the transparent good things about what your company offers? that might sort of help them make a decision about a job. Okay. Love and that. so then, yeah. And so Love you that. take sticky notes, right? You give everybody multicolored sticky notes uh, on your team and you give them Sharpies and you have them fill in the quadrants. So pick a job, right? Job, a developer, whatever, and get your team to start filling in the quadrants. And if you're doing this right, you might also invite some of the Java developers in your organization to participate, right? To inform uh, properly who we're talking about, right? So they're not all the same, but you have to make some generalizations in order to create uh, targeted campaigns. And so this is, this is a best practice in marketing. And it started to be more widely used in recruiting after I started kind of sharing this around. Uh, so then you build a persona and there are some tools that you can use to help you with this, um, right? Some of the people aggregators like Hire Easy and Seek Out have a lot of insights about uh, what groups um, some of your candidates would be in on you know, places like Facebook and things like that. 
And then there's some market analytics uh, companies that do a similar thing. Uh, Claro and Horsefly um, do some of these things and, and it'll give you salary data and you know kind of help you build the picture and fill in the blanks for who is this person that we are trying to target for this job. And like I say, you might have multiple personas for just one job, but doing this exercise really helps you understand who are you talking to when you write that job description or create that job advertisement. Uh, and you shouldn't do any of that without doing this first. So I'm currently, um, uh, my team is helping to rewrite all of the job descriptions for JP Morgan Chase. Uh, so if you can imagine the effort that's going into that, wow. right? <laughs> uh, there's, an there's, undertaking. there's an undertaking. Yeah, there's 13,000 jobs. Yeah. Right. And so we're rewriting all the job families. Uh, I had to work with them to decide what was locked in in their Oracle Cloud ATS versus what could be edited by recruiters and then train 1400 recruiters on how to write interesting marketing language at the beginning of a job description without bias. Yeah. So we had to create a, a library of bias terms, uh, which is extensive and some things that you wouldn't believe are in there, like the word drive and driven. Uh, so if you can imagine all the purpose driven and uh, right words and, and verbs that are going to be in these uh, old job descriptions that they've got that have to be removed and, and edited out. You can't rely on chat GPT or any other uh, AI to do this because they, the descriptions they give you, not only are they flowery, but they're also yeah. full of bias terms. Bias terms. Yeah. So you need human eyeballs on, on that sort of thing. So I've got a, a clean blank version of this and the uh, empathy map. If you want those, um, I'll send you a link. You just uh, message me on LinkedIn and I'll, I'll send those to you. And uh, they're very handy tools. These are in um, uh, PowerPoint format so that you can easily fill them in. All right, some tools for you. Uh, SmartRank um, helps you make um, uh, hiring managers decide what good means. Okay. So you, you basically are forcing hiring managers to better define uh, what's important and, and exactly what they mean by the descriptions that they're making. And it's very interesting in doing this exercise I'm doing with um, JP Morgan Chase. There's a lot of things that were in what came back from the SMEs as required. And I had to push back and say, why and what does that really mean and what do you mean by um you know proven right i mean let's let's define that and so smart rank kind of helps you do that um hone it gives you audio recordings and chops it up into verbal little bits of interviews that you can do with your hiring managers and send to candidates and vice versa um I suggest that you screen candidates with landing pages and knockout questions. And let me explain why. Um, when you get uh, an application from Indeed um, and you use their easy apply, which almost everyone does, there is very little chance that you're going to have a knockout question in there. And even if you do have a knockout question that says, are you currently uh, living in and available to work in XYZ country that you're hiring for, you're still going to get about 70% wrong candidates that to say yes to that. And so it's better to have um, a landing page where you can ask a little more detailed knockout questions and get more accurate applies. Um, so JobSync does a good uh, job of this. They call it an integrated apply. And um, it allows you to put a layer that looks like you're not even leaving Indeed to the candidate in between Indeed and your applicant tracking system. Um, there are multiple chat bots that will do this as well. Um, uh, Humanly, Appy here, of course, uh, Paradox, Olivia's uh, chat bot will help you do some of these things. I've implemented, I think, all of them. 
So if you ever need any assistance uh, deciding on what's right for your situation, um, I'm a good person to ask about that. Uh, applying directly to your applicant tracking system. If you've got one that is, I'm not going to name names, but let's say Workday. <laughs> and you have to log into it in order to apply, you're going to have a, a terrible conversion rate. Your candidates are going to drop off. So what I recommend is doing, uh, setting up your Indeed applicants to do an Indeed offsite and go to a landing page that you create. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, all right. Okay, so this is best practices for creating a landing page. And we're, we're going to run short of time, so I'm not going to read this to you. You're going to get these slides, um, but uh, there are some best practices. So just letting you know. Um, okay, so I use a tool called the Jot Form for all kinds of things, for surveys, for any communication you want to do with me through my website. You can also build just about any kind of form you want. So this can act as a landing page um, between, you know, Indeed or Google or Facebook or anywhere that you might want to get people to apply to your job. Um, and you can customize this to look however you want. And it's free, 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 right? And your candidates go into a spreadsheet and you get an email notification and it's beautiful, fantastic for, for instance, a hiring event or a college event, um, right? Any of these uh, things where you might want a one-off uh, situation and you don't want to have to go through HRIS and get all these, right? And so you're not going to ask um, sort of personal information or social security numbers or anything like that when you do uh, something that's not integrated, but um, where you have to do a quick apply, this is fantastic because then you can just email them all back and say, oh, by the way, now finish your application here and you're going to get a much higher conversion rate because you've already got them in your system. You're talking to them now yeah. and you know, you've know you captured the initial conversion, which is the most important thing. You can also do this with Zapier. So if you've never built any Zaps, this is a really, really fun tool. Zapier <clears throat> gives you three free Zaps a month. Um, and then you have to pay after that. I pay for 20 a month. But I've got a lot of processes going on. But they have these built-in formulas or recipes, as they like to call them, that say, okay, you're going to attach this application to this application. And when this thing happens this application is going to cause this application to do something, right? So whenever you get an email saying X, Y, Z, your calendar invite automatically goes to that email address and sets up uh, an interview time, right? Um, something like that. You can do that for free, right? Yeah. With, with Zapier. It's awesome. But they also have, okay, so I just, I just learned uh, recently They've got this new beta thing called Interfaces, which is, it's been out for a little while. I've been playing with it, but it it showed me one when I logged in recently that, and this is the brilliance of Zapier. They know what I do. So <laughs> they're, they're showing me right. things right, right. That, that I want, image generators, AI content ideas, and an applicant tracker. This is freaking amazing. So post a job and get notified for new candidates while keeping applicants, materials, and statuses organized in one place. All right. So this works very much like JotForm. It's your sort of form-based CRM. And it starts like this. So this, this is a page. And a page uh, in Zapier gives you this formula already. So a job posting, a thank you note, and the applicant tracker, which is literally just like in JotForm, um, a spreadsheet of your candidates. Okay. So you can, you can customize all this, but this is what the out of the box, the application, the job application blank looks like. All right. Um, so this is what the candidate sees. You can get a link to this and host it on Zapier's custom link. 
or you can embed it on a landing page of your own, on your website or anything you want. Um, anyway, any questions about that real quick? Because that's pretty freaking cool stuff. It's, I, I just got to say, all these are fantastic tips and tricks. Um, some of the pointers you're handing out, out are fantastic. Are fantastic. Um, right. I'm looking in the chat and it looks like everybody is responding very positively, but I think you're doing a great job being fairly succinct. So there's not too many questions at the moment. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> uh, hopefully I've done this enough that I'm explaining things. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. All right. Um, okay, I did a project uh, a couple of years back for um, Ross Dress for Less. Uh, they had a problem in their warehouse uh, facility outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in a small town where there were 97 other warehouses. All right. And so they were competing with Amazon and Walmart and you name it. And they're in the middle of this farm of warehouses and they're not having an easy time attracting. They're, they decided to consolidate um, all of their outsourced uh, agencies and let uh, Accenture's RPO handle everything. Well, Accenture RPO didn't know how to do talent attraction marketing um, for warehouse workers outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So they hired me to help because their own internal marketing team costs too much for this project. <laughs> wow. uh, God wow. bless Accenture. And Ross Dress for Less was a willing uh, participant and did all kinds of cool things that I helped them to kind of discover about themselves and, and fix processes that they thought they would never change. One of them was when they were posting their jobs, they were using, they, they were kind of cloning a template in their applicant tracking system. And that template, carried over old JSON metadata. Uh, and so when they post their jobs, the jobs looked like they were three years old in some cases. Mm. And so when you go to search for them on Indeed or Google, they were way down the list. And so it was costing them a lot of money. And so I fixed it uh, for them just by showing them how to post a net new job in their ATS. And they saved what they estimated was about $342,000 in advertising cost in one quarter. For real. <laughs> For real. Wow. Yeah. But one of the other things we did was a very um, boots on the ground uh, sort of methodology. We just looked for a restaurant in the area where a lot of the uh, warehouse workers would go. And we offered to buy them uh, new menus if they mm -hmm. would just let us put a job advertisement on the menu. And they said, yes. And it worked. We got dozens and dozens of people applying who were very interested and in right there. Uh, and so there was no ghosting and it worked great. So the QR code set up an immediate come over here as soon as you're ready uh, and, and fill out this application. Um, and so sometimes thinking outside the box, my friends, is is just that. It doesn't have to be super techie, um, it, it, right? I mean, the QR code is the techiest point of this or the text job to this number. That's my phone number, by the way, if you guys want to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, there's also a, a really interesting thing um, that we learned, and that was advertising on um, podcasts. So this wasn't necessarily perfect for warehouse workers because in the warehouse, there were 26 different languages spoken. But when we got, okay, so that project was so successful, by the way, that Accenture got the retail stores business as well. And mm. they asked me to help them with that. So when we got to retail stores, we found that a lot of these folks would listen to podcasts. And it turns out, that that really works um, advertising on podcasts. If you look in Spotify and just type careers um, in their podcast area, uh, you'd find that there's over 5,000 podcasts just about careers, okay? And the attention rate and the recall rate and the action rate on ads on Spotify or any other podcast blows away advertising you can do pretty much anywhere else. And so we found that radio commercials were pretty good, right? Local radio. Um, but uh, Spotify advertising was even better. And we tried everything, Hulu, you name it. So this was, this was what worked best for me. Um, okay. 
a job description transformation. What I'm doing with JP Morgan Chase right now, remove ac acronyms and internal jargons, you language up front, right? Speak directly to the candidate. You're this type of person. We're this kind of company. Think of what we could do together, right? Replace your bias words, optimize your job titles with keywords, get your internal jargon out of there mm. and right. Go search for your own jobs and see where they come up. All right. So AI tools, chat GPT and Bard are the big winners right now, but I love using a tool called beyond Bard, which is a Chrome extension. And when you do a Google search, it gives you the results of all your search results. It summarizes them in the sidebar. Okay. And then it suggests questions you might want to ask to narrow down what you're looking for. And you can further ask more questions. So let's say you go to a Boolean search for Java developers or whatever um, that match this kind of job. Uh, well, Beyond Bard will say, all right, here are the top candidates in this area. And then you can just point it to your job description and say, which of these match this one the best? Okay. Now you have to be careful about how you do that matching stuff, sure. but um, it, Beyond Bard is, is amazing. I love it. Um, there it is. So you can see right over here, the summary. Um, and anyway, so good tool. All right. Communicate. If you do SMS messaging in the United States, um, you're going to get a, an increase open rate of your emails of 15% immediately. So you just add a text message to an email campaign and you're going to get a much higher open rate. The same thing goes if the people that you're sending an email to see even a bad advertisement for your job. So, and in this case, you want it to be a bad advertisement. You don't want them to click on it because that's going to cost you money. But if they see it, if you're just in their peripheral vision because of your social media activity, job advertisements, text campaign, they're go you're going to get higher open rates on your emails when you do outreach. Um, I use a CRM that is built into my Gmail, right? So some companies are now using Google Workplace as their system of record. And there's a tool called GMAS that acts as a CRM. And you just point it to a spreadsheet of names and email addresses to populate your to field. And then you can personalize it and send a blast right from GMAS. And it is, wait for it, free. Free. Amazing. I saw it. Great, great. Yeah. I love free, right? And so it acts just like uh, just like any other CRM. It's amazing. Hey, Craig, I hate to be this person, but just as a time checker, we've got about five minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm what looking. Because you, what you're sharing here is, is so good. We're about done. Uh, this is the tool that I use for text messaging. It's called Pivot CX. And basically, it's a, can it's a candidate contact center. You can also do phone calls and video from it, but it's really great for those um, text blasts. And then you can have a conversation directly with the people. And it gives you a, a central phone number for your location. So you've got a local number. And, um, you know, it's not the spam that you normally uh get and it, it it really increases my open rates for all kinds of things um and then pillar let's talk about pillar with uh, <laughs> the ai platform that makes it easier for you to run a faster and better interview process um so we're fans uh of pillar and with i'll let you talk through this slide uh yeah so just in short anyone who's not familiar like i said at the beginning pillar isn't uh an interview intelligence platform um, and what it part of what it is through record the recording of interviews um, we're able to uh, uh, standardize the interviews by injecting scorecards and allowing scoring candidates in real time so you're not chasing that stuff down afterwards um, it auto also um, through AI draws out uh, uh, coachable moments and, and moments where you can help your team become better interviewers I don't think any interviewing is a skill um, and, and that's something that that, that, that that we help out quite a bit with. Um, and then also let, let you really drill in on, uh, you know, skills, ba skills based hiring and, and, and cutting down how generic uh, you, your approach to hiring can often be in interviews. Yeah. And so if, if you haven't been paying attention, skills based hiring is sort of the uh, word of the day 
uh, right? So AI and skills-based hiring are the two most popular things talked about uh, on, in recruiting circles on LinkedIn right now. And so Pillar kind of gives you the best of all of those worlds, which is really cool. All right, so that is all of my slides, except for this one, you wanna prove it. You wanna be able to track all the way through to hire and know where your candidates are coming from and how much they're costing you. Because if you can't prove it, it didn't happen. And then finally, um, yeah, you could get my book or contact me. Uh, and here's all my info. And hopefully you'll all connect with me on LinkedIn and we can hang out because I do that. Um, I, I answer questions and, uh, and, and have fun and, and build relationships like a good recruiter should. Great. Thanks, Craig. Really appreciate it. Tons of good information there. Lots of tips and tricks that I'm sure everybody is, are going to take away. Um, all right, folks, I think it's time to wrap this one up. Um, obviously, I want to extend a massive thanks to Craig for joining us today and sharing all his great knowledge and perspectives. Um, as I said, great stuff. Um, on behalf of the entire Pillar team, I want to thank, say thank you to everyone who attended today. Uh, you'll see, you'll receive a copy of this shortly, and we'll send out a blog recapping it tomorrow. Uh, and as, as Chris alluded, as Craig alluded, the first uh, 50 registrants, you'll also receive a copy of his book, Hiring Humans. Um, real quick before we go, uh, mark your calendars for our next webinar, which is December 19th. Super excited about it. Um, we'll be joined by Cara Brennan Alamano from Lattice, Dustin Can from Splunk, and Tess Manderson from Terminal. Dustin. They will, they, they will host a session, Talent Acquisition Wrapped, where we'll discuss the major HR and TA trends that were most impactful for businesses in 2023 and the lessons they learned. Um, thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Hope you see, hope to see you next month. And again, thank you so much, Craig. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Whit. Appreciate you guys. Take care.